The Great Plateau is a very high, mountainous plateau in 100 million AD. Since the Cretaceous period to the Eocene epoch of the Paleogene period, Australia became separated from Antarctica, slowly moving north across the Pacific Ocean towards Asia. Where the two continental plates met, one was pushed below the other, creating a subduction zone to the southeast of the Asian landmass, as the ocean lithosphere, the rigid outer layer of Earth, was drawn down into the mantle and melted, new magma was produced, resulting in large amounts of volcanic activity. Now, in 100 million AD, Australia's short life as a single continent is over, and it has finally fused with the southeastern edge of Asia and later the northeastern edge. Seafloor sediments and rock between the two landmasses have been compressed, sheared, ground together and thrust up into a massive mountain chain. This new chain exceeds the proportions of the Himalayas, the highest mountain range of the Quaternary. Like the Himalayas in their time, these new mountains continue to rise. As the tectonic plates crush against one another, they simultaneously compress the rock downwards into Earth's mantle and upwards into the sky. Further compression has raised a large block of Southeast Asia to form the Great Plateau, the broadest tract of uplands on the surface of the planet. This immense plateau, surrounded by mountains, towers over the shallow shelf seas which cover much of the landmass. Newly formed mountains are sharp and jagged. It takes time for the constant assault of rain, wind, frost and running water to erode them into rounded shapes. In 100 million AD, the Himalayas are mere hills, undulation in the center of the continent. The Great Plateau, on the other hand, consists of ranges of pointed pinnacles and knife-edged crests dropping away into slopes of fragmented rock and scree. The valleys and basins between the ridges have filled with newly eroded debris and formed upland plains, surrounded by peaks reaching up to 10,000 meters, higher than any mountains of the past. How will life survive at this altitude? The climate of the weather-beaten peaks of the Great Plateau will certainly be harsh, but Earth during 100 million AD is warm and volcanic. Uh. Sea activity has thrown large amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, making survival easier. There are ample resources for life to flourish. The Great Plateau, this system of high plains and basins, hemmed in by the highest mountains in the world, is not the dry, cold desert one might expect. Back during the reign of humanity, high-altitude mountain systems such as the Himalayas were home to little more than hardy desert herbs, shrubs and small rodents. Not so the valleys and plains of the Great Plateau, 100 million years on. These are rolling grasslands. At the outer edges of the Great Plateau, the steep, Debris-covered slopes are swept by winds bringing seasonal rains up from the shallow seas. The heavy rainfall and loose soil make for an unstable surface, prone to mudslides and rock falls. However, in many areas the surface is stabilized by plant life evolved to cope with just such conditions. The oceanward slope of the Great Plateau is green with true grasses. Ridges and banks of vegetation undulate down into the layer of cloud drifting up from the sea. Beyond a narrow coastal plain, sunlight glints on the crest of the waves. Earthquakes are common, as the plateau is still being pushed up, and it is on the center of the the meeting point of multiple tectonic plates. Grass trees are grasses which have resilient, woody stems. In the human era only bamboo generated such stems, but in 100 million AD there are many different species of grass trees native to the Great Plateau. Grass trees are keystone species on the Great Plateau. Their complex underground stems stabilize the loose muddy ground, preventing landslides and making it safe to traverse. Their seeds are harvested by silver spiders, caught in their webs which are spun across the canyons, and are fed to the poggles which the spiders farm. The grass trees of the Great Plateau are wiped out in the 100 million AD mass extinction, leading to the collapse of the ecosystem as animals are deprived of the seasonal influx of grass seeds. The poggles are not just tolerated, they are actively encouraged. The carnivorous silver spiders are farmers of a different kind. The grain harvest is there to feed up the livestock before it is butchered. The poggle is a species of rodent native to the Great Plateau of 100 million AD. It is among the last of the mammals. Poggles are at home in the many caverns honeycombing the plateau, usually sharing their caves with a colony of silver spiders. Large black beady eyes give the poggle good vision, a necessary tool for living in mostly dark caves, though like their ancestors they can grab with their forepaws. A herbivore, poggles mainly, if not exclusively feed on the seeds of grass trees.
Poggles are low in the food chain, having been turned into livestock by the silver spiders, who feed them the grass tree seeds to fatten the poggles up, and when this is accomplished one spider takes the poggle prisoner and presents it to the queen, who then kills it. Female poggles in estrus in particular are specifically eaten by the queen spiders to help them reproduce. It is unknown if poggles leave their caves or face predation from other animals. Just as some species of spiders in previous times spun webs with an ultraviolet sheen in order to attract insects, so too do the spiders of this time. Spread across the slopes of the Great Plateau, giant silver webs billowed gently in the wind. The silver spider is a species of colonial spider native to the Great Plateau of 100 million AD. The silver spider, judging by the structure and body shape has likely descended from the redback spider or a similar species, when Australia completed its continental course, colliding with Asia and North America the spiders over millions of years, adapted numerous behavioral traits similar of that of the order Hymenoptera being ruled by a queen with the majority of all spiders spending their lives as workers. This behavioral system advanced further following the relationship established between the spiders and the poggles, a shy rodent of which the spiders farm as livestock. The silver spider behaves rather like Hymenoptera, being ruled by a queen with the majority being workers. Their shiny appearances are due to the colors being meant to reflect ultraviolet radiation in their high-altitude home. Their webs are the largest in the world, to build, the smallest and youngest workers parasail from one side of a gorge to the other with a dandelion and a silk thread. Once this is completed, a by. GGER worker comes over adds another line and walks out onto the thread in a few hours they will complete the web which looks as though it is made up of smaller webs sewn together like their ancestors they do possess venomous fangs. The silver spider have established a behavioral system similar to that of Hymenoptera, being ruled by a queen with the majority being workers the workers will spend the majority of their lives constructing webs in between cave systems and collecting grass tree seeds for the piggies to consume when the toggle reaches ideal weight the plump rodent is slain and devoured by the spider queen, allowing her to access the hormones from the poggle's bloodstream of which she acquires. Silver spiders have formed a relationship with the poggle, a rodent and one of the few mammals still alive sadly the poggles have been turned into livestock by the spiders who feed them seeds from grass trees caught in the webs fatten them up and when this is done the now plump poggle is slain and devoured silver spiders themselves are food for the great blue windrunner though it's possible the spiders feed on them too, the windrunner is small enough to be caught in the webs though aside from the poggle it is unknown for certain what else the spider eats. The great blue windrunner can soar at high altitudes making use of its long narrow wings at low speeds the bird requires greater maneuverability and so deploys an additional pair of wings from its legs for extra surface area and uplift. The great blue windrunner is a large species of gruiform bird native to the lowland regions south of the great plateau of 100 million ada descendant of the cranes it is notable for having a second pair of wings in its hind legs. The Windrunner is a descendant of human-era cranes when Australia completed its continental drift, colliding with Asia and North America much of the crane's habitat was replaced by an enormous mountainous range the crane abandoned its wetland marshes and rivers in favor of a migratory lifestyle. The crane has developed long narrow wings as having a large wingspan allows the Windrunner to cover larger distances to increase its maneuverability and further aid its landing when descending on mountainous peaks the Windrunner evolved wing feathers down on its legs. Time equals 0.2 s, greater than this not only allows the bird to cover larger distances but allows for a smoother landing. Soaring at such a great altitude leaves the windrunner vulnerable to harmful ultraviolet rays, which led to the evolution of the windrunner's blue plumage, which repels the sun's harmful UV rays. The windrunner is a migratory bird that visits the plateau during the spring and summer months, where they nest and raise their young. The windrunner's coloration is designed to repel harmful ultraviolet radiation. The windrunner has also evolved its wing feathers down on its legs, giving it a tandem wing appearance which allows the bird to travel greater distances. The windrunner is a migratory bird covering large distances to find food for their young, which they raise and care for on mountainous peaks. One of the primary reasons the windrunners choose to raise their young on mountainous peaks is the absence of large predators, as few predators can survive out on isolated, lifeless plateau. The windrunner only comes to the plateau during the warmer seasons where they can nest and care for their young in relative safety. Carnivorous, the windrunner's diet is made up of silver spiders which they snatch from the spanning webs in the plateau's many canyons. 
While it may be possible the Windrunner itself is vulnerable to predation by the Silver Spider, it is unknown if the Windrunner faces predation itself, in the plateau or otherwise. Although the Great Blue Windrunner is generally regarded as being plausible, with most present-day crane species either being endangered or having declining populations, it is doubtful evolution could give rise to such a species. The silver spider is a controversial topic, due to the way it has manipulated the poggle. Realistically such fast-breeding rodents could easily outnumber and escape the spiders. Most viewers stated that the idea of mammals being on brink of extinction is implausible as mammals are highly adaptable even at huge losses. Arguments include that surviving mammals would most likely not get outcompeted by reptiles, fish, birds, and invertebrates in the way presented in the future as wild, which some fans even found insulting. Realistically fast breeding rodents such as the poggle may have easily outnumbered and escaped the silver spider, though it may be possible that the poggle repr. Oduces more slowly than other rodents. 